Hi everybody, I hope you're well. Today I will read from a book titled Clip and Corb on the Road by Ivan Zaknich, published by Scheide Grunspies. Tim Benton wrote, When Charles Edouard Janaré met August Klipstein in Munich in 1909, a friendship began that had momentous consequences for the young man. From March the 10th until September the 27th, 1911, they walked, talked, sketched and photographed together. Janaré's version of this uh, journey to the East has been well documented by Le Corbusier himself just before he died and by several scholars more recently, not least even Zaknich, who made Le Corbusier's account of the voyage available to an English readership. The publication of Klipstein's very different journal with uh, Zagnitsch's insightful analysis and documentation transforms our understanding of this formative event in Janoré's education. We learn much more about their personal relationship, about their interaction as draftmen, not excluding a little rivalry, about their different approaches to photography, about their intellectual exchanges. But, of course, so many questions are left unanswered. It is clear that Janoré himself saw the journey to the East as the end of his apprenticeship. Writing to his parents, he was explicit. These eight months, which will mark the end of my life as a young man and will be a crown and coda to my studies, will be spent in Constantinople, in Greece and in Rome. Was Le Corbusier interested in Klipstein's field of research on the Cretan painter El Greco? There is nothing in the correspondence or the diaries to support this, but it is noteworthy that the modernist Le Corbusier and his friend Ozenfant in December 1920 published a detailed and well-illustrated article on El Greco in L'Esprit Nouveau. Klipstein's thesis was not mentioned, needless to say, but El Greco was an interesting choice for a journal which was focusing on the classical lineage of Cubism in Ingres, Cézanne and Syrah. How much did the future Le Corbusier learn from Klipstein's philosophizing? He clearly understood the main lines of Waringer's arguments in Abstraction und Einfühlung, Abstraction and Empathy, since he quoted the German art historian's celebration of oriental pattern making and design that had no need for representational figuration. But how much did he learn about Waringer's views about empathy or those of Robert Vischer, Theodor Lips, August Schmarsov, Heinrich Wolflin and others in the German-speaking world? It is extremely likely that Klipstein could have told him a great deal about these theories. It would be fascinating to speculate that Janoré's increasing interest in the abstract effects of plain surfaces picked out in strong sunlight, a feature of his drawings and photographs in the Balkans, was stimulated by ideas of the role of empathy in translating strong formal effects directly into emotion. By the 1920s, this is what Le Corbusier believed. These forms, primary and complex, delicate or brutal, have a physiological impact on our senses – sphere, cube, cylinder, horizontal, vertical, diagonal – and move us. It is evident, however, that whatever Janaré had learned about empathy in 1911, it was Amedeo Zenfant in 1920 who encouraged him to adopt this physiological view as a means of establishing the aesthetic potential of an undecorated architecture. It does seem clear that Klipstein's interest in El Greco and the Byzantine sources, the subject of the thesis he was working on, did not deflect Janaré from his pursuit of the two main goals of his Voyage d'Orient, vernacular crafts and architecture and antiquity. He had been primed by his close friend and mentor William Ritter to seek out the rich colors and vigorous forms of the Balkans, a passion shared with Klipstein, and he pursued the search for origins in the obsessive quest for an authentic culture represented in the wild and ragged black earthware pots, many of which they bought and shipped back home. Some of these Le Corbusier kept all his life. 
His conversion to classicism in Germany in 1910, not least under the influence of Peter Behrens, in whose studio he worked for nine months until April 1911, meant that Athens and Rome, and a vision of the Mediterranean, were always going to be on the agenda. Writing to his parents on December 2, 1910, he enthused I am obsessed with a vision of beautiful straight lines, but also subtle and classical proportions, infinite clarity in the harmonies under an intense sun and with sunsets so pure you could die in ecstasy, an arid and bare plain, but also blue Apennines and then the cypresses, Rome. But John Array's big discoveries went beyond the suggestions of his mentors. His exploration of the Turkish mosques opened up a wholly new way for him of understanding circulation and the dramatic effects of sequencing small and large spaces. Although he wrote to his teacher Charles Le Platinier, saying that the mosques in Istanbul were generally poorly built buildings, his studies of mosques in Istanbul and Bursa remained important for him all his life. His progressive shift from photography to drawing in the course of the trip is a move towards a deeper architectural understanding. It is perhaps significant that it is after Kleptine's departure that Jean Ré carried out his most significant architectural analysis in his sketches in Pompeii and at the Villa Adriana at Tivoli. Jean Ré's use of photography, however, also became more analytical as the journey progressed. Since his purchase in April 1911 of an expensive camera with rising and cross fronts, Jean Arre had briefly tried to take professional quality photographs on a tripod and with great care in composition. Writing to Le Platinier, he was still enthusing about this camera in July. Oh, the wonders of photography, good old lens. What a fantastic additional eye. I bought myself a terrific camera, working with it is quite a business, but the results are perfect. Since April I haven't spoiled a single plate. Some of his best photographs, from a professional point of view, were taken in Prague. These were taken on a 9 by 12 cm glass negatives, usually on a tripod. But he increasingly used a 6x9 cm roll film holder to take more informal handheld shots, and in October he bought a cheap Kodak Brownie in order to be less encumbered. Jean Ré developed some interesting techniques to bring out the architectural qualities he admired. For example, he was fascinated by the architectural impact of blind walls to the street. He also used photographs to illustrate his obsession with the separation of domestic space from the street in many photographs in the Balkans and in Istanbul. He wrote evocatively about the heaven of peace and tranquility created in these houses. This kind of thing does not seem to have interested Klipstein, whose careful notes and sketches are typically of things, artworks or places. Even Zagnitsch makes an insightful comparison between the ways Jan Ray and Klipstein recorded the devastating fire on the night of July 24, 1911, emphasizing Jan Ray's much more emotional and lyrical response. It is significant, however, that when Jean Arre walked through the still smoldering ruins, he shot off a roll film of images of the brick shells of houses that had lost their wooden balconies, in which can be seen the eye for abstraction that would surface later in the Citroën house model 1921. Klipstein had, however, taken abundant photographs of buildings and places in the earlier trips to Italy and Spain. Jean Arre wrote to Klipstein asking for pictures he might have taken of bridges and gardens in Spain. The friends had agreed apparently that all the photographs were to be shared as research documents, and Jean Arre made a complete set of contact prints of his photographs apparently to send to Klipstein after the journey. It is likely that these were never sent off since they remained in his possession at his death. Jean Ré also bought some photographs of buildings in Istanbul from Seba and Joyer, who had acquired the stock photographs of the Abdullah Brothers Agency for shared use. 
Klipstein did not seem to view photographs in this way, apart from some severely underexposed pictures of mural paintings on Mount Athos, we do not have many examples of research photographs by Klipstein and there is no evidence that he asked for his share of the photographs that Jean Array accumulated during the journey. For Jean Array, the journey to the east marks a kind of watershed in which his commitment to architecture over painting or design was sealed. It is less clear what the voyage meant uh, to Klipstein in terms of his research on El Greco or his intellectual development in general. What is clear is that he retained strong memories of their friendship and shared adventures. Even Zachnitsch has assembled an extremely rich documentation that will reopen studies of the Voyage d'Orient. His understanding of both men, their ideas and their work will hold the center ground of all future discussions of this important event. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Bye.